So I just wanted to give you a little bit of introduction to who I am. Um, my name is Marguerite Mathern. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I grew up in Covington, Louisiana, not Covington, Georgia, although I thought it was really funny that there's a Covington so close to here. Um, it's right outside of New Orleans, which sounds really exciting, um, but really it's like any other suburb that's ever existed. So, but maybe with better food, I don't know, it's arguable. Uh, and I went to Georgia Tech for my undergraduate degree and my master's and my PhD. So I've it's almost a full decade I've been at Georgia Tech, which is kind of horrifying to say, but um, I've been there since 2011. Uh, and I'm expected to graduate in May, uh, this upcoming May, um, despite COVID's best efforts at derailing me, it did not succeed. And I'm going to graduate on time, knock on wood. <laughs> Um, and so I enjoy running and doing yoga, which has been great during quarantine. It's kept me pretty sane, lots of YouTube yoga. Uh, and I also have two cats pictured here, Sammy and Mauricio. Uh, Sammy, we got a few months ago and Mauricio we've had for a while. Uh, so I think maybe you've seen David's cat. So I'm also a fellow cat person. Let's see. All right, and just a little bit, very brief intro into my research. So I said I was a mechanical engineer, um, you know, just like any other good mechanical engineer, study honeybees, because why not, right? Um, so I look at how honeybees um, collect and transport pollen. So I'm looking at that process from a mechanics perspective. So you might be surprised to learn that pollen collection by honeybees actually has a lot to do with fluid mechanics. And the reason for that is, is because when they go to a flower, they'll collect both pollen and nectar, and then they'll mix a little bit of nectar with the pollen, and then they form it into um, these pellets, which you can see, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but it's on the um, that first picture on their back leg, that big yellow thing, that is a pollen pellet. Um, and so they have a bunch of structures in their bodies, which is, you can see in this uh, middle picture, in order to pack it into uh, this pollen and it gets embedded in all these crazy hairs that you can see. Uh, so I've done, my research is experimental. So the first step was um, looking to see what a honeybee does in the hive with these pollen pellets. So you can see that here, uh, it just scrapes its little pollen off into the cells. This video took me two summers to get and I'm very proud of it, even though it's short. Uh, and then, so I mimicked that in the lab. Um, we had a whole set up because I wanted to measure the force to remove the pollen pellets. And sadly, I cannot just attach a force sensor to a honeybee's leg, that would be so much easier. But instead I had to build this whole contraption in the lab um, to measure the force to remove the pollen pellets. And um, the whole question with this particular study we're trying to answer is, um, we're trying to explain the behavior that the bee does in the hive. So we know that it removes its pollen at a specific speed. And so we wanted to see what would happen if we sped it up. Like what if we went way faster than what the bee does? And the answer is that it takes a lot more force and a lot more energy to remove the pollen at different speeds. And so um, I, I won't go too much into it because uh, it gets into complex fluid mechanics, which is not something you will learn in this class. Uh, but so complex fluids behave way differently than simple, regular Newtonian fluids. And this, this fluid of the pollen is actually um, it gets harder to remove uh, at the higher forces, at the higher speeds, because um, all those particles are hitting each other, basically. That's like a very high level explanation of what's going on. Uh, but yeah, so that's a brief intro into me and my research. And I'm here teaching you because I love to teach and I love fluid mechanics. Um, so yeah, does anybody have any questions or comments briefly about that before I move on to the actual material? Come on, guys, you're making me look bad. <laughs> I know it's it's weird with the online stuff because um, I'm just like a little talking head, which speaking of which, I'm just going to turn my video off now so I'm not floating head. Laura in the oh. chat says, congrats for your graduation. Thank you. Thank you. I'm very excited. I've been in school for way too long now. <laughs> okay. All right, so now to dive right in, um, we're covering external flows this week. Um, and unlike David, I'm a mechanical engineer, so these are actually quite fascinating to me. I know he doesn't like them, but that's why I'm here. Uh, and so an external flow is 
any kind of flow where the fluid is flowing around something. So think of planes, right? We have air uh, flying over the plane or a car, same thing. Uh, fish swimming, um, my honeybees, uh, you know, flying through the air. It's got to move through that air. Um, and so external flows cover all those things. And the specific phenomena that we're really interested in here are uh, lift and drag on cars and airplanes and understanding those concepts have led to a lot of advancements that'll make them both more fuel efficient and stable, which is good news for all of us. Um, and also, so that's um, air, right? And there's also similar improvements for ships and submarines. Uh, and another example of that is buildings, right? Um, there's lots of wind patterns that happen that buildings have to not fall over for. So um, all of these external flows are, are very practical and important. Okay. Uh, and so if I'm sure you talked a lot about internal flows before, and if you remember that for internal flows, you probably talked a whole bunch about loss. So for external flows, loss is not as important, but instead what's important is the net force. that's acting on the body. And then, so that net force is due to drag and lift, which I alluded to earlier. And also, so this is something that will be covered next class in detail, um, but for right now, just introducing it. And then um, I wanna start with a note on the coordinate system that we're gonna use, because it's a little bit different than maybe what you would think it should be and what it has been. So a quick note on that, we're gonna fix the coordinate system on the body of interest. So this is the body in our flow. And so the system that we're gonna consider is the fluid flowing past a stationary body. That's gonna have some velocity, which I'm going to call U, capital U. Ooh. So to kind of tell you a little bit more of what exactly that means, we're gonna picture a car. Ooh, that's a bad car, but you all have the idea. All right, so you're driving in your car, right? The car is moving through the air at some speed, U. But it gets really complicated to think about that mathematically if we think about the car uh, moving. So instead, what we're gonna say is that our car is fixed in place. And we're gonna have our coordinate system here. And instead, we're gonna model the fluid to be moving at a velocity U. So think of it kind of like a wind tunnel, right? Like you've seen all those, those commercials with the cars and the wind tunnel and the airstream going over them. That's essentially, it's mimicking um, behavior on the actual road by holding the car still and moving the fluid. So that's how we're gonna think about external flows. And here, so this U, in, um, in the case uh, where the car is fixed and the, the air is moving, this is known as the upstream velocity. And generally for uniform flows, we consider it to be uniform and steady, it makes our lives easier. Okay, any questions about that? Is everybody with me so far? Okay, and I guess I forgot to mention, if you have a question, feel free to interrupt me, like turn your mic on and interrupt me or put it in the chat. And I'm sure either one of you or David will interrupt me and let me know. We have a question in the chat from Rami. He says, upstream going which way? That's a great question. So generally, um, 
it just depends on how you define it. Um, so here in, um, let's do this, in this picture that I drew right here, I have the velocity going from right to left, but I could have drawn it the other way, right? I could have drawn it this way, right? But in the way that I have it drawn now, uh, coming from right to left, the upstream is this way. And the reason we call it upstream velocity is because once it hits the car, right, it can't just keep moving like normal. It's going to be interrupted because there's a car there. And so the, the velocity like right here at the top and over here and back here, that's all going to be different um, than this capital U. So upstream velocity is that uniform and steady velocity happening before it hits the body. Uh, Good question. Uh, one question. Uh, so what I'm understanding is like, we're not, okay, so the car's not going to be moving. We're making it stationary. But when it says like system passes stationary, the, what is velocity you is going to be the air, right? And what you just explained it was that you is going to be all the way until the moment it touches the car, everything changes by the, at that point. Correct. You're exactly correct. Yeah. So before it hits the body, it's going to be moving at a constant, uniform, steady velocity U. And then the instant it hits the car, it's going to change because there's a car there and it can't just keep going through it. Okay. So you're but exactly we're considering right. the car always stationary, right? It doesn't. Yes. Okay. Yes. Any other questions? Um, I have one. What happens if like the car was not moving at a constant velocity, but it was accelerating? So how would yeah. you treat that system? Um, that's a great question. I think that that is beyond the scope of this lecture, I would say. Oh, okay. But that's good fine. question. Yeah. Oh yeah, relative velocity. David just put that in the chat. <laughs> okay, any other questions? Very good questions. Okay, again, just stop me at any point if you have a question. Okay, so we talked about the coordinate system. Now we're going to talk a little bit about the actual bodies. So we're going to start with three general characteristics of bodies. So the first one is just a 2D object. And so a 2D object is a body that extends infinitely in the cross stream direction. And so I will explain a little bit more about what that means. And so an example of that is a circular cylinder. So let's imagine we have a circular cylinder. So this circle is like the end of it, the, the cap, and it's going to extend infinitely into the, into the paper. It's going to go on forever into the paper. And the reason we consider that a 2D object is because it goes on forever in that direction. Nothing's really going to change in that direction. Um, you may, you probably have done that when you went over Nodder Stokes, which again, sounds like David doesn't like, but I love Nodder Stokes. <laughs> and so this is our circular cylinder. Again, the long part ex is extending forever into the page. Um, and we're fixing our, our coordinate system on this stationary cylinder, and we're going to model the fluid flowing past at a uniform steady velocity u. OK. And then second, second type of body is axisymmetric. And this means that it is rotationally symmetric in the streamwise direction. Okay. 
And I realized I didn't really explain cross stream um, for the first one. So cross stream basically means that the body extends infinitely in the perpendicular direction to the actual flow. And then in the streamwise direction, right, it's in the same direction as the flow. So again, I will draw this for you. And so an example of this, which will test my drawing skills, is a blimp. So I'm going to draw the coordinate axis, x, y, z, and I'm going to change colors. So we can imagine this blimp. And again, our uniform steady flow with feet U uh, crossing over that. And so this blimp um, is, is symmetrical in around the x-axis. And so then we can consider it to be axisymmetric, which again is going to make our lives easier because we can simplify things. All right. And then last, we have 3D objects. And so for a 3D object, the dimensions. Mm. Sorry, I'm go sorry. ahead. Yeah. Question. One example. What one example of x x is symmetric will be like a football. Yes. If I'm yeah. getting it. Okay. But is it infinite? Like it is not. It's not infinite. It doesn't have to be infinite. Oh, what is infinite is the previous one. Okay. So for 3D objects, uh, dimensions along all three directions, or all three axes rather, are comparable. And so basically that means that we can't neglect any of them, right? Like for axis symmetric, we can simplify some things because it's um, rotationally symmetrical, but for a 3D object, um, we can't do that. Because uh, like for an example, if we think of an airplane, right? It's not symmetrical. It's not infinite. It's really big, but it's not infinite. And you know, there's no way to simplify the flow around that, and it still be a good simplification. I mean, we could, but I don't think any airplanes would be taking off. And I'm not going to draw an airplane because it would look really bad because I can't draw. But um, hopefully, that makes sense. Okay. Does anybody have questions? Any more questions? before I move on. Okay. All right. So next we're gonna start delving a little bit more into flow past a body. We have a question from Rami. Sure. Does can 3D objects be like irregular shapes? Yes. Definitely. Um, you know, 3D object could be literally anything. Um, and so most things are 3D objects, right? We're talking about engineering. You know, you're not going to build anything around an infinite cylinder because infinite cylinders don't exist. Um, but you, uh, anything else that has a flow going around it that's not symmetrical or not really, really long, it's going to be considered a 3D object. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Okay, now we get into the fun part. So to start our conversation in flow past the body, I'm first going to set up a flow situation for you. So let's say we have a circular cylinder that's infinite. And so we have X and Y. And so this cylinder is going to have a radius lowercase a. And it's in our good old upstream velocity that is steady and uniform, U. OK, so I told you way at the beginning that we are talking about um, 
external flows have a lot to do with drag and lift. So let's start talking about forces acting on here. So we're gonna have a resultant force on this circular cylinder from the flow, uh, partially in the y direction and partially in the f direction. So fx and x, fy. And the question, or the problem rather, is to solve for fx and fy. Before we start, um, I'm not actually going to have you solve it because uh, it's a little bit complicated, but um, we're going to do kind of a holistic view of this. So when solving for that, we're going to assume that we have an inviscid flow, which means viscosity is not important, and that we're also going to say body forces are negligible, so gravity is not important. So the forces are just totally due to this flow. Okay. So now uh, I have a question for you, which is what causes the forces on the cylinder? And to answer that, um, David, could you put the link in the chat if you have it handy? Yep. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. So I have it's just like an online polling thing that you can use. Um, on your phone, on your browser, wherever. And you should see, if you click the link, a question pop up. And so what causes the forces on the circular cylinder? So we said no viscosity and no gravity. So which of these two or both? You should be able to select multiple do you think is acting. And I'll give you all a second to think about it. Okay, I think most everyone has answered it now. So the correct answer, pressure. And so the reason for that is, right, is because we said it's in viscid flow, which means there's no shear stress because shear stress happens from uh, viscosity. Does that make sense to everyone? Any, any questions on that? Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. So now we know there's, we just have to worry about pressure when we're talking about the force on this cylinder. So if I wanted to draw the pressure distribution on the cylinder, does anybody have any ideas on what it would look like? Like what would the pressure be in the front compared to the back and up here and down here? Any just general thoughts on what that pressure distribution would look like? And you can just yell it out. I don't have a, a, a poll for this one. Front would have greater pressure. Okay, anybody else? Would it be a parabolic? Um, how do you mean? Well, you at the going by the um the steady the stream whatever. The box <laughs> on the left side, so that would absorb most of the force. Therefore, it would uh, essentially be the bottom of the parabolic would be at that on the far left side of the uh, square uh, circle, and then it would swoop over both the top and the bottom in a decreasing fashion. So you're almost right. <sighs> um. 
Yes. So I think you and Rami, Rami, Rami. I don't know. Hopefully I said your name right. But Rami, I think the two of you together have the right answer. So we will have a pressure. Um, we'll have a pressure at all points. And it's it's kind of parabolic because it's going to increase as we go up. And then it's going to be symmetrical on the bottom. And so this is what your pressure field looks like. And right, pressure is always normal to the surface. And I realized that I didn't draw that super symmetrically. Let me try again. But it's supposed to be symmetric. So the pressure right here at the front is the same in magnitude as this pressure right here in the back. They're just opposite in direction. And then same, you know, at every point. So does that make sense to everyone? Yeah, okay. I have a quick question. Sure. I've seen um like in simulations like on YouTube and stuff like that. I've seen like when the wind hits an object, the front of it experiences the greatest pressure, but the back of it experiences almost or like very low pressure. Shouldn't that be also the case in this one? Yes. You are exactly right, actually. And so what I wrote down, right, is pressure distribution is expected to be symmetrical because it's submerged in a fluid, totally surrounded by this fluid. It should be symmetrical. Um, and that's what, you know, mathematicians figured out, like, a long, long time ago. But when you actually, like, if you actually do this, like, you put a cylinder in a flow and then you measure the forces acting on it, it's not true, right? Right it's you do like have a pressure differential and so great thoughts and i will expand upon that um a little now sydney has a question on the chat sure. why why is the pressure the greatest at the top of the pipe um it is the greatest that's a good question um think about that for a second The greatest because our, um, I think it, it's because the velocity is increasing. The, so this fluid is having to flow around our our cylinder, right? And it's having to like make up for things. And so it ends up um, changing its speed. And so that ends up changing the pressure on the top. You Laura to asks in the chat, can you explain that again, please? And I think she asked this right before Rami asked his question. Okay. Um, about the pressure distribution being symmetrical? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, so it's symmetrical because, so we have this uniform flow going through, right? Uh, and our cylinder itself is also symmetrical, right? So it's a circular cylinder, it extends infinitely down. Um, so we can expect this flow, it's gonna look something, you know, comes in and then it's gonna go like this, something like this. Oops, I'm bad at drawing. Okay, there we go. So it's gonna look something like this. So our flow around it is gonna be symmetrical. And we know from things like Bernoulli's, right, that, um, you know, if you're, as your, your velocity and everything changes, your pressure is going to change proportionally. And since it's symmetrical, um, that pressure velocity relationship is going to be the same on both sides of the cylinder. Does that make sense? Yes. I just got confused when like, for the like the the bottom and the top was gonna be different or something like that, but now that that's what I thought I understood that the distribution it was gonna be symmetrical. Thank you. Okay, no problem. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. So again, right? Um, the pressure distribution is expected to be symmetric. And if it's symmetric, then 
Fy and Fx should equal zero uh, because the pressure will cancel itself out, right? Because it's you know positive one and on one side and negative one on the other side. If you add those up, it ends up being zero. And you know, like we said, it's not actually true. So um, this mathematician D'Alembert, who's a French mathematician in like 17 something looked at this problem and came up with this whole solution and said, okay, the, there's no force on this, um, on, this, uh, on this cylinder in a flow. And so that looks something like this. So if our theta, right, if this is our cylinder, if theta is the angle, like where you are located on the cylinder, And then as you go through theta, so this is 90, 180, and zero, this is theoretical. This is what Dylan Bear said it should be. But when you actually do these experiments, what you end up getting is something like this. So this is pressure on the y-axis. And so then people were like, okay, your math doesn't seem to be right. But then they couldn't figure out why uh, for 200 years. So um, Remy, I think that was you. He said that the pressure is lower um, at the back. So it took 200 years for people to figure out why the pressure was lower at the back than it was at the front, which is, is you just you know figured out in like five minutes. So good for you. Um, okay. So with that being said, we know Dylan Bear's wrong. We know the math is wrong. Um, well, the math isn't wrong, actually, but it's something that we did that is not correct. So my next question, so again, this will be on the poll. Um, let me stop this one and do this one. So the same link that David sent, uh, which he just sent again. Thank you. Um, and so what is the cause of the discrepancy between these theoretical predictions and the experimental force measured on a cylinder? in an external flow, just um, any ideas. And I'll give you a hint. It has to do with the assumptions that we made. But maybe we had a bad assumption. All right, so a, a good many of you have answered. Uh, so I'm seeing um, the um, assumption that P atmosphere is zero is not true. Uh, body forces are not negligible. Um, the flow is not inviscid. Something to do with the magnitude of the pressure relative to atmospheric pressure. Either the viscosity of the flow contributes or the body forces need to be taken. Great, taking on both the assumptions, I like it. When the fluid hits the object, some velocity is lost. When it reaches the back, it has a lower pressure. Um, so that's actually, that last one, I, I like that because it's exactly true, um, but it's also because the inviscid flow assumption is not really correct for this. So, um, the answer here 
is that the inviscid flow assumption is bad. And even if you have like a really, if you have a fluid with a really, really small viscosity, right? Um, and normally maybe you'd be able to call that inviscid, we can't do that here. Uh, and again, it took people 200 years to figure out exactly why. And so, oh, also by the way, this is called um, D'Alembert's paradox. Okay, so um, specifically, although most of the flow is inviscid, what happens is there's a layer right next to the surface where the viscosity is non-negligible. And that area, that layer next to um, the body is called the boundary layer. So I'm going to draw some pictures for you for what exactly that looks like. Okay, and so we're gonna talk about this uh, in di at different Reynolds numbers. So um, if we have the same cylinder every time, if our uh, at increasing speeds of our fluid. So first we'll talk about a really, really low Reynolds number of 0 0.1. So we're gonna have our cylinder. And so I'm gonna draw streamlines. And so what happens is this fluid approaches and then it sees, oh my gosh, there's a cylinder and it spins around and it goes above the cylinder. And so at this really, really low Reynolds number, this flow cannot be considered inviscid whatsoever. So the viscous effects are important everywhere. And our streamlines are symmetric. So I didn't draw it for the bottom, but they're exactly the same, just flipped, mirrored. Okay, so that's at a really, really small Reynolds number. If we increase the Reynolds number to about 50, we're gonna have the same cylinder. And then we have our streamlines. And so what's gonna happen here is this layer starts to form. And so our streamlines do something like this. And so basically our, uh, our velocity is unaffected until it hits this, um, the, where I drew the dotted line, this area, and then it says, oh my gosh. And that's the viscous effects coming into account. And so above this dotted line, we have inviscid flow. And below the dotted line, we have viscous flow. Here, let me actually move this down a little bit. So, uh, there we go. And so this region, the viscous region becomes smaller. And it also loses its symmetry. 
so right the back end of this viscous area does not look the same as it does in front of the cylinder and another interesting thing happens as you increase the reynolds number your flow actually starts to separate and what that means is right here so i draw that little blue dot on the cylinder uh, instead of you know like up here it just kind of keeps going around but here our streamline can't keep up uh, with the curvature and so it ends up separating and then you basically get this like back flow here And it separates because the inertia of the fluid particle is too great. Rami yeah. asked, does speed affect this? Yes, it does. Great question. And remember, because um, we're talking about Reynolds number, and if we assume that all of these are the same circular cylinder, then uh, Reynolds number equals density times velocity times diameter over uh, viscosity. So if our, um, if our cylinder is staying the same and our fluid is staying the same, then the only thing we're changing here is velocity. So as we go up in Reynolds number, our velocity, we can consider the velocity increasing. But if you change the, the cylinder, that will also change your Reynolds number. And that's why, if you were specifically asking about the separation, um, it does have to do with the velocity because, right, inertia is that like acceleration. It's like going so too fast and it can't keep going and stay on this curved path. So it kind of flies off and goes its own, dir own direction. Okay, and then last, we're gonna look at a Reynolds number, really high Reynolds number of about 10 to the fifth. So again, we're gonna have our circle. And this time when it's going really fast, this viscous layer, that's formed is really, really thin and the front. And so our streamlines still feel the cylinder, even outside of this viscous region. And um, so this, um, let me write this. So again, above the dotted line is inviscid, below the dotted line is viscous. And so this thin layer that's formed is what we call the boundary layer. And it has a thickness that's normally denoted as delta. And so we can say that delta is much less than the diameter of this. Um, ooh, I spelled diameter wrong. Diameter. It's much less than the diameter of the cylinder. So it's really, really thin. But as we know, um, it becomes really important because it creates that net force on the cylinder itself. And another interesting thing that forms um, because of this is this area behind the cylinder which we call the wake. And so here, you know, um, as we said before, right, the flow will separate. It also separates here. So it has a separation point like right here. And this streamline goes like this. And all in this wake, you kind of, you have eddies happening, going in different directions. And just so you know, this is figure 9.6 in your textbook. So if you wanna look at a professionally drawn picture, you won't hurt my feelings. But 
um, it essentially says all the same thing. Okay. So I have one more body to talk about in a, an external flow, but does anybody have questions on the circular cylinder? So we're going to revisit this in a little bit of different way with flow past a flat plate. And again, so this is figure 9.5 in your textbook. So we're going to do the same thing. Um, we're going to first start with a Reynolds number that's about 0 0.1. And we're going to draw our plate and it's in this uniform flow U. And so at this low Reynolds number, again, we're gonna draw a dotted line. We're out here, we have inviscid flow and inside our dotted line, we have viscous flow. And just like um, before, the viscous effects are gonna be strong everywhere. Everywhere meaning everywhere that's like remotely, even a little bit close to this plate. All right, and then going up in Reynolds number, and we're gonna go to about 10. We have the same flat plate. And just like with the cylinder, this viscous area is still big, but it's smaller than it was before. I just want to make a quick note. Um, they're, they're using a different textbook. So for, for oh. our textbook, it would be 1126 and 1127. So 1127 Sorry. would be that first one. So that would be 1127. And the second one would be 1126. Yeah. Sorry, I thought you were, oh, 1126. I thought you were using same one, my bad, but thank you for the correction. No problem. Okay, so yes, at the Reynolds number about 10, this viscous area becomes smaller. And then lastly, at Reynolds number of 10 to the seventh, Again, we're seeing this really thin area, and this time it's going to start right at the front of the plate. So this is inviscid. This is viscous. And again, um, this is our boundary layer. It's going to have a height delta. And if our plate has a length L, then delta is much length, much less than L. And then one last quick note about this. So I drew your streamlines before um, for the circular cylinder. And so this time I'm gonna draw a velocity profile. And so if we draw an axis here, right? So that's basically starting right at that back end of that plate. And what happens is above the boundary layer, so above this viscous region, we still see this velocity u that uh, we saw coming in as our upstream velocity. But below, uh, when you're in the boundary layer, because right viscous effects are important, it's going to be slowing down our fluid particles, so it becomes parabolic. And so that's the same for all of these. I'm not going to draw it each time, but it's um, you know decreasing as it comes, the velocity decreases as it comes in the boundary layer or the viscous area, and then outside of it, it is the same as the upstream velocity.
Okay. So just to reiterate and kind of summarize everything we just talked about, we know that viscous effects are important in the area next to a body. that's in an external flow. Even if that flow has a very small viscosity. So it could have like a teeny, teeny, tiny viscosity, but next to the, next to the body, it, it still matters. And the area, so the area where viscous effects are important depends on the Reynolds number of the flow. So it's kind of a very high level summation of everything I just told you. Any questions? Okay, if there's no questions, I have one last thing to close this out. And so I told you about classifications of bodies earlier. Um, okay, I see your question, Rami. Is it the area of the entire body? Um, okay, so maybe I should be a little bit more specific in how I'm defining area. So I assume when you're so is area is it the area of the entire body you're referring to um what i just wrote down in stars is that correct yes okay so um just um it's sorry go ahead i can like um, ask a better question so when the when the streamlines hit the body is it like the cross section of where it's the area where it hits the body or the entire like flat surface you know what I mean? I think I think so. Let me say something, and maybe you can tell me if it actually answered your question or not. Okay. Um, so this area that I'm talking about is the area of the fluid. It's not the area of the body, right? So I'm talking about this viscous area. So this, um, right, under this dotted line, where viscous effects are important in the fluid. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Does that make sense? Yes, yes, it does. Okay, Thanks. so let me, yeah, no, great question. Let me rewrite this. Viscous effects are important in the area of fluid. How about that? Sorry, it's a little messy. Does that, that reads a little better, I think. And then I, it's hard to write and talk. So the area the fluid depends on Reynolds number. Any other questions? Okay, I'll be quick because I know we're almost out of time. Um, uh, David, do you need time at the end or can I take up the rest of our three minutes? It's all yours. All right, okay. Um, so one last classification of bodies. Uh, we talked about this earlier, but I have a totally different type of classification for you. So first is streamlined, which maybe is a word you're familiar with. And so a streamlined body has little effect on the surrounding fluid. So it's kind of like, eh, you're there, but whatever. I can just go on flowing outside of the boundary layer. 
And the second type is a blunt body. And sometimes I've seen this called bluff. It's the same thing. Um, and so these types of bodies have a great effect on the surrounding fluid. So I have one last poll for you. Uh, again, from the same link as before. And so my question is, based on, you know, this, looking at these two bodies, which one of them do you think is blunt and which one do you think is streamlined? And the one I'm specifically asking in the, um, in the poll is, do you think a flat plate is streamlined or blunt? So remember, streamlined means it doesn't have a great effect and um, blunt means it does. Oh, it's 50-50 right now. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead, since we only have a minute left, I'll go ahead and show you. The correct answer is streamlined. So if you remember I said, right, the velocity, um, it returns to, to what it was originally once it leaves the boundary layer and below that it's affected. But if you're just above this plate, you might have no idea that this plate is there. But if we go back up to our circular cylinder, right, we could see um, even way up here, right? If you look up here on this really high Reynolds number one, along this streamline, it doesn't totally go back to normal. It's still like, oh, there's a body here way below me. So it's really disruptive to the flow field. And so, you know, if you want a streamline body or a blunt body, it depends on what you're using this body for. So an example of a streamlined would be like an a airplane wing or a race car, right? Like you want those things to move through without a lot of resistance because you want them to go fast. Um, but if you are building a parachute, right, a parachute that was streamlined probably wouldn't be very effective um, because it wouldn't slow you down at all. So uh, parachutes and buildings are examples of blunt bodies. Uh, and with that, I think that's all our time. I'm sorry for not having too much time at the end for questions, but um, thank you for coming. And I'm glad I got to teach you all today. <laughs>